Turn to Proverbs 8, 6. Wisdom continues here, and she says, Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. Let's look at that first part. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things. So in essence, wisdom is saying, listen up. She's saying, hear. That's really a, that's an entire sentence right there, because a semicolon separates sentences or independent clauses. Hear. I don't think, was there a, no, yeah, that was a period before that. So right there is a whole sentence. Hear. She's telling you, listen up. Listen to what I'm saying. Here is to perceive. To uh, perceive or have the sensation of sound. To possess or exercise the faculty of audition, of which the specific organ is the ear. Now, there's something you didn't know. (laughs) To exercise the auditory function intentionally, to give ear, hearken, listen. So when she says hear, she's not instructing the eardrums to pick up vibrations. She's instructing the person to pay attention, to listen to what I'm saying, because I have something really important to say, wisdom says. When I was in high school, if I remember right, when a verb was there without a noun, mm-hmm. it was actually a command, mm-hmm. not just instruction, but a command. Yeah, it's a, Is that uh, correct, or I, do you remember? I would think so. It would be an imperative. Yeah, it, yeah. that's the imperative. word, imperative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I would think so, yeah. So that's... Imperative is like a command. Yes, it is a command. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I don't. I was just trying to think. I don't. I can't think of another one-word sentence like that that wouldn't be a command. Mm-hmm. I don't think. Well, it's been a long time since I went to high school, and it's a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> right. To remember that exactly. Well, it's been a long time for you, and I didn't learn anything when I was there. So between the two of us, we're we're kind of hopeless. So. Uh, <laughs> A wise man will hear, increase learning, and attain to wise counsels. So if you want to know if you're wise or not, well, do you hear? And do you actually pay attention to what you hear? Do you increase learning when you do hear? Do you actually learn something from it? And do you attain to wise counsels? Proverbs 1.5 A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. That's how you know a man of understanding. He goes and asks other people questions. He asks for help. He asks other people's advice and opinions on things. The wise guy is not the guy that knows everything. He's the guy that knows that he doesn't know everything and he needs to ask other people for help that know things that he doesn't. So in order to be wise, we must hear counsel and instruction. Proverbs 8.33, which we'll get there here in a few weeks or, well... A few, that's a relative term. We'll get there in a little while anyway. Uh, Proverbs 8.33 says, Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. So uh, the, the result of hearing is to be wise if you hear it in the sense of paying attention and focusing on it. And then Proverbs 19 and verse 20. Proverbs 19, 20. Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. That was the verse that I was referring to a minute ago when I said that when wisdom tells us to um, understand wisdom and be of an understanding heart, uh, talking to the simple and talking to fools, um, and I said that that means that people that, that don't have wisdom can get it, and it doesn't even matter how old you are. You could be 90 years old and lived your life as a complete fool. And you could decide, you know what, I am going to get wisdom. I want to get wisdom. You could hear counsel and be wise in your latter end. doesn't matter. You only maybe have a year of life left. You could be wise then. So there's no excuse for not getting wisdom. You can't say, well, I'm old. This is the way I've always done things. That's no excuse. We should be swift to hear, slow to speak. But, you know, most people, including uh, most all of us, to one extent or the other, are just the opposite, aren't we? James one nineteen. James one nineteen. Says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, 
slow to wrath. Now, why would James write this commandment? It's because the people he's writing to are not slow to hear or slow to speak and swift to hear, right? Well, that, like when Paul said that he writes the same thing to every church, right? Whatever's written in the Bible to one church or one group of people is applicable, generally speaking, to everybody. So what does this mean? It means that Christians and people in general are swift to talk. Quick to talk and slow to hear. Just the opposite that we're the way we're supposed to be. Isn't that the way it is so many times? You're in a conversation or a debate or an argument, and are you really listening to hear what the other person has to say? Or are you thinking about what you're going to say next? I mean, that's, that's human nature, and it's you know, something that we all should work on because that is not being wise. The wise person is quick to listen and then speak. I like the old saying that God has given us two ears and one mouth, and we should use them proportionally. Yeah. <laughs> Denny had a class for his law enforcement, and the guy asked the class of guys, he said, so when you're in a conversation with someone, you're either speaking or, and they all said listening, and he said, no, you're either speaking or you're thinking about what you want to say next. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is very true. Well, I mean, I guess to our defense as human beings, when you are in a conversation and you hear something you want to respond to, you don't want to forget that you want to respond to it. So it is kind of hard to pay attention to the rest of whatever the guy is rambling on and on and on about because you don't want to forget what you wanted to say about you know, the thing that he said 10 minutes ago. So it does help if you're talking with somebody that has some conversational skills that speaks for 30 seconds to a minute and then pauses and lets you respond. And, you know, so it is a little easier to be swift to hear and slow to speak if you're talking to somebody like that. But some people, my experience is, you just have to interrupt. There are people out there, and I've met plenty of them, if you don't interrupt, you don't get to say a word. But generally, people like that, they don't care about being interrupted, I've found. And I've just learned I'm not an interrupter, but I have learned to interrupt certain people because otherwise you can't have a conversation with them. They'll just go one thing to the next thing. There are some people that I actually find, I have found interesting, where in the conversation, I'm not even hardly paying attention to what they're saying as much as I'm paying attention, I'm just trying to, to understand how they could continue to talk and blend one subject in with the next one, transition from one thing to the next. And I just find it fascinating. I just can't do that. I just can't ramble, unless I'm in a sermon or something, unless I'm in a Bible study and I can just ramble on forever. But, but if I'm not in a Bible study, I just can't ramble on and on and on from one thing to the next. They don't need and, a sank way. No, <laughs> they don't. It's just amazing to me. And, and I just sort of listen and I just kind of smile and nod and, I'm, and what I'm really paying attention to is how you can continue to transition from one thing to the next and just never stop. <laughs> it is interesting, but anyway, yeah. So the reason for hearing what wisdom says uh, is that she speaks of excellent things. Because that, that she gives the explanation there. Here, what did she say? Proverbs, um, I'll just flip back in the outline here. Uh, here, for I will speak of excellent things. So she's giving the reason, you know, that for there is telling why you need to hear because uh, she has excellent things to say. And excellent is, um, when we're speaking of a person or thing, that excels or surpasses in any respect. Preeminent, superior, supreme. Of qualities, it means existing in a greater or an exceptionally great degree. So the things that wisdom has to say are excellent things. They are superior things, superior to anything else that you could listen to. And that's what the Word of God is. It is something that is superior to every other book, every other story, every other piece of wisdom or philosophy that you could read. It's superior to it. And therefore, it makes sense that wisdom says here, because I've got superior things to tell you about. And the excellent things that wisdom speaks of are the words of truth. And you can see that from turning back several chapters to chapter 22 of Proverbs, verses 20 through 21. Proverbs 22, 20 through 21. You probably recognize these verses too. 
and you probably recognize them all. I guess you read Proverbs every day. But these are ones that, that I know I've used before in, um, remember the Ask the Pastor Bible studies? Mm-hmm. In some of those, I would start out with this verse. Here are these two verses. I remember that. that you started the Bible studies that way? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Judy, I'm very ashamed of you. That you wouldn't remember every single thing I've ever said over the last eight years. I can't believe it. I don't remember the first of it, but I remember that the thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto yes. thee. I yep. remember that part. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's the part. Well, isn't that nice? <laughs> See, at least Carissa pays attention to what I say I, like, anyway. I don't remember the first part, uh, but I remember those last two lines. <laughs> have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. So that's why the Bible's written to us, to make known to us the words of truth, that we can answer the words of truth. So we can be ready, as Peter says, to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's within us with meekness and fear. But I, what I really wanted from this verse was, have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, And then it defines what those excellent things are, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. And what does the Bible say about itself? What did Jesus say about it? Thy word is truth. Right? The Bible is the words of truth. So when we're instructed out of the law of God and grow in knowledge, we will approve the things which are more excellent. So when we read wisdom's excellent things, we will then grow to love excellent things, to approve of excellent things, to want to mimic excellent things. Look at Romans 2 and verse 18. You know why people in this world don't approve of the excellent things that the Scripture teaches? Right? The scripture teaches a lot of excellent things. Well, they, they don't read the Bible. They don't understand the Bible. So they don't approve of the excellent things. They don't approve of waiting until you're married to have sex. Right? They, they think that's foolish. Right? That's just stupid. And that's just re- suppressing people's natural desires and their, what would bring them happiness. They don't approve of those excellent things because they don't understand the scriptures. Uh, Romans 2 and verse 18. He's talking here to the Jews that have the scripture. He says, and knowest his will, that's God's will, and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. You know that you are a mature Christian when you approve the things that God approves of and you disdain and hate the things that God hates. It says in Psalm 119, verse 128, I believe it is, that therefore I... Esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. So you approve the things that God says are right. You esteem everything that God says to be right, and you hate every false way. That's when you're well on your way as a Christian. Uh, Look at Philippians 1, 9 through 10. Philippians 1, 9 through 10. Paul says, In this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. It says, um, Jesus said, that wisdom is justified of her children. Wisdom's children, God's children, will justify wisdom, will show that wisdom is just. In other words, wisdom will approve, uh, wise people, God's children, will approve of what wisdom says and teaches. That's one of those things. It's not that God needs us to approve it. He's not looking for our approval, but he's pleased when we approve it. Our approving it doesn't make it true but it shows evidence that we are God's children. It's just like in um, Romans 12, too. If you not, no, how, do, how does it say? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove mm-hmm. what is that good. The perfect and acceptable mm-hmm. will of God. Yeah, that's right. Same thing, rejecting the rejecting 
wickedness and proving and holding fast to the truth. Yep. And some excellent things that wisdom speaks of are things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, virtuous, and praiseworthy things. Philippians 4 and verse 8. These are excellent things. These are the things that wisdom speaks of. Finally, brethren, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. In other words, think on excellent things. Think on holy, godly, good, wholesome things. A good way to do that is to turn off the TV, right? Because you don't find true and virtuous and lovely and good report and things like that on TV very often, do you? I mean, I suppose there may be a decent show out there. But if you turn on an even news, you're not going to find anything that probably matches up with any of those uh, attributes there in Philippians 4.8, that's for sure. Or, for that matter, social media. I'm not on, I have a, you know, Facebook account for business purposes, but I so I don't have friends on there. I don't see people read people's posts and things like that. But I have been told, uh, my brother told me this, that he had not been on there for years. He got on there because of his business, and and he used to spend some time on there. And he said it was just so negative. I think especially with the last election, and he said everything that people would post on there was just nasty and negative, and and it just got to the point where he just stopped, just didn't want to didn't want to see any of it anymore. Um, so yeah, that's that's a good way to to uh, ruin your mood and temper temperament is uh, to indulge in that kind of stuff a lot. I heard yeah. someone like get rid of his social media because his family members started bickering on Facebook. <laughs> really? So yeah. It's out uh, there for others to see, it's not private. They they post it. Oh, I thought you could privately. They intentionally do it. Yeah. They intentionally did it. I guess. Yeah. I don't think most people worry about any of those privacy settings. You can set them, but yeah. No, I've well, I've looked people up just to see if who you know, like old people from high school, just curious what they're doing, and. Some people are, have everything locked down pretty well, but some people, there's a lot of stuff there that cause I'm not friends with them that I can still see. But mm-hmm. Yeah, pe- people have no, pretty much no discretion when it comes to social media uh, these days. Most job companies now will check their Facebook page for job interviews. Oh, yeah. They do. We did at work. Yeah, we oh, yeah. check them before we even call mm-hmm. for an interview. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people who didn't even get called for interviews because of what we saw on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. yeah. They put it out there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. very fast what the caliber person is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess in that way, if I was an employer, I'd be happy that people are on Facebook because you, know, you can filter out a lot of duds. And see who your, who their friends are. Mm-hmm, right. And then the second part of the verse. She says, Here, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. So wisdom speaks only right things. Now, none of us can say that, can we? That we I mean, w- sometimes we say right things, but none of us can say that we always say right things, unfortunately. But wisdom does. She only speaks right things. Uh, right, when you're speaking of persons or disposition, it's disposed to do what is just or good, upright, righteous. Of actions, conduct, etc., it is in accordance with what is just or good, equitable, morally fitting. It's also... Agreeing with some standard or principle, correct, proper, and also agreeing with facts, true. So right things can be morally right or they can be factually right. You know, and, and wisdom speaks both things, things that are morally right and also things that are factually correct. Uh, wisdom is not out there telling lies, obviously. So all of wisdom's words are in righteousness and there is nothing forward or perverse in them. And this is just a couple of verses down, which we will get to probably next week, I suppose. Proverbs 8 and verse 8. She says, All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. In other words, they're right. There's nothing froward or perverse in them. 
There's nothing untrue. There's nothing contrary to God's law in there, contrary to the truth. That's what forward and perverse essentially mean. And God's word is pure. It's righteous. It's right. Proverbs 30 and verse 5. It's the one book in the entire world which you can rely on 100% and know that every single thing in it is right. Morally right, factually right. There's nothing in it that is incorrect in any way. It'd be so nice. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in the new heaven, in the new earth, and pull up the local news, if there is such a thing, and everything you hear is right? Everything you hear is true? Every book you pull off the shelf, that every single word in it is right and true, and you never had to worry and wonder and think, is this really true, or am I being duped? That'd be amazing. The only book that we have on earth like that right now is the Bible. That's the only one that we can be guaranteed is right and true. Uh, Proverbs 30 and verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So you can take this word of God and know that every word is pure, and you can use it as a shield. You can bank on this thing. You can, you can apply its principles in your life, and you can know that it's going to protect you. If you do what it says, it's like a shield. It will protect you from the wiles of the devil. It'll protect you from bad ideas out there. It will protect you. I would be curious how the other perversions translated that verse. Probably wrongly, if I had to guess. <laughs> they do get it right once in a while, but I'd be surprised. The exact verse is right. They've got so many others that are wrong. Right. Oh, yes. Their word is not pure. And that's the thing. And that's the thing about the Bible, too. Thanks for bringing that up. That's a good point. If, if your understanding was as most people's understanding of the Bible is, and that is it's probably really close to being 100% accurate. It's 99%. There's probably some, maybe some scribal errors in there. That, you know, but more than likely, everything that, the, that the, was originally inspired and written down, it probably mostly got copied over right. The, the translations are not perfect, but you know, we're getting the general idea. If that's your idea of the Bible, and then you come across a verse that is either a difficult verse, which appears to be a contradiction, what are you going to think? Well, that's, that's, that's where they wrong. messed up. Probably mistranslated. Probably a scribal error. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to be condemning the Word of God. Or, one even better, you come across the verse and it really steps on your toes and it says something that just outright condemns you. And then you think, well, we don't know for sure if everything was perfectly translated and perfectly copied over. And real, maybe God really didn't mean that. Maybe, that. maybe Paul just said that because that was his opinion. I've had yeah, people say that. And at the yes. time, women wore their hair bombed. Right, yes, exactly. Things like that, right? <clears throat> or, you know, oh, in those days, the women sat on the one side of the church and the men sat on the other side of the church and they were yelling over their husbands. What did the preacher say? And that's why Paul said women have to be silent in church, right? You get crap like that, right? And making up stuff. And so, yeah, and I've heard that, that uh, interpretation before. I wasn't even making that yeah, up. but desperate. <laughs> right, well, I mean... You got to come up with something whenever you got words too plain to deny. But if you have the view of the scripture, like we do, that every word of God is pure, uh, not every word, every comma, every punctuation point, that it's 100% perfectly inspired and preserved, then you've got nothing to worry about. And if you see something that appears to be a contradiction, you can know for certain. It is not a contradiction. I may not understand it right now, and I can't explain it, but I know for sure this is not a contradiction. I know whatever this says is true, and I know that there's some way that these two verses that seem to be conflicting each other, I know that there's a way that they can both be understood and, and find the truth. And when you have that attitude, then you go digging, and a lot of times you'll end up finding the truth that you didn't know because of the fundamental principle that the scripture is true entirely. And I've had that happen to me before, where I came across the contradiction, and because I knew that there, well, I came across what I thought looked like a contradiction, I knew there couldn't be. Mm -hmm. And I just kept digging and digging 
and then I found some really neat stuff that I would have never found if I would have just thrown my hands up and said, "Wow, well, you know, probably just a, just a contradiction, you know, it's scribal error. Well, what do you think about people who do not take some of um, the words here literally? It's like, remember we had a conversation with someone saying, well, what's the lamp for? Like, sh what this person was talking about, oh. the virgins, and it's like, what, mm -hmm. what could, it's like, there's always a meaning. She wants to put meaning in every word in the passage. Yeah, like, more figurative, allegorical meanings yes. to things, and, yeah, I mean, that, so that is a... your advice to a person who does that? Well, it depends. I mean, you, everybody takes parts of the Bible literally that they think are literal and figurative that they think are figurative, right? Nobody takes the Bible entirely literally. Nobody takes it entirely figuratively. Even people that say they, they take it entirely literally, of course they don't. They wouldn't say that Jesus is, actually has wool, right, on his body, that he's actually a lamb or that he's a stick or something, or he's a, he's a, you know, a bunch of clumped together hard dirt, like he's the rock or something. Obviously, nobody takes the Bible entirely literally, um, so it's a matter of using comparative scripture, comparing scripture with scripture, using primary definitions unless there's a contradiction or an absurdity or the context just, you know, clearly demands it. Things like that can help to understand then when verses are being used in a figurative context or in a literal context. And it's just a matter of, of understanding how to interpret the Bible the way the Bible says it's to be interpreted. And, and I think it comes with experience. And the more you learn, the more you, you know, then the more you can easily identify parts that are figurative versus parts that are literal. But yeah, I, I don't think it's it's unwise to be trying to spiritualize everything and look at some deeper hidden meaning mm -hmm. in everything because there are plenty of parts of the Bible that are just straightforward and they're just teaching something plainly. Um, so, in that case, it was a parable. So those things do represent things. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, if you're reading a parable, then trying to see what the the parts of the story represent is that's not incorrect. Um, and then Psalm 119, verse 140. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll definitely only get ver two verses done tonight. Got a little long winded. Psalm 119, 140. Thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servant loveth it. It said in Proverbs uh, 35, every word of God is pure. Here it says, thy word is very pure. Refined seven times. That's right. Psalm 12, 6 through 7. Now that you bring that up, Bev, we'll just read that. Psalm 12, 6 through 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Unless you're reading an NIV, and then it says, You'll keep the needy safe and protect us forever from the wicked. So, yes, the words of God are pure, like fine silver that's been burned seven times and it keeps burning off those last little impurities until it's perfectly pure. And then the, Lord, the word of the Lord is right. Because wisdom says, the opening of my lips shall be right things. Well, the, God's word is right. I'll give you a verse. Psalm 33 and verse 4. Now, I know you know this, but I think sometimes it's just good to read the verse. There's a lot of people out there that don't believe the Word of God is right. As a matter of fact, probably the majority of people out there, at least certain parts of it, they would say, no, nope, that is not right. Mm -hmm. But it is right. Psalm 33 and verse 4, For the Word of the Lord is right, and all His works are done in truth. Anything that contradicts the Word of God is not right and must be rejected. That would be things like the theory of evolution, feminism, critical race theory, 
which if you don't know what that is, I may talk about that one of these days. Critical race theory is basically this idea that, that the United States is inherently racist and that all white people are racist, whether they realize it or not, and black people have been systematically oppressed and, and things like that. Or um, just the, the, the teaching that debt is good. There's a lot of people out there that believe and teach that debt is good. They really do. They encourage you to go into debt. I've had people, debt, debt. yeah, debt. I've had people, tell, I've, had, I've had Christian people tell me that, well, you know, it's, it's, it could be a good idea to get a mortgage because uh, you can write the interest off on your taxes. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Because if you pay $100 in interest, it's not like they, the government just gives you $100 back in your taxes. It means you don't pay taxes on that $100. So maybe if your tax rate is 25%, you don't pay that $25 in tax. So you just spend $100 to save yourself $25. It's the dumbest thing in the world. I mean, so, you know, we'll take a 30-year mortgage out because you'll, you'll get to write more, off, more of the interest off in taxes. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So anyway, I mean, and, but there's people out there that teach it. Or um, the idea of peaceful parenting. You ever hear of this? And maybe you haven't heard the term, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, you, know, you don't spank your kids. You just reason with them. You know, when your two-year-old's throwing a fit, laying on the floor and pounding his hands and screaming, you just sit down and reason with them. You know, do some Socratic method there. Yeah, I mean, you know how that works out. Yeah, uh, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, the scripture says. Or the idea of gender fluidity, right, where you can just be whatever gender you want. You might, you might be one, you might be the other, you might not be either. You, you might be non-binary, as they call it. Um, those things are not right. Abortion, sodomy, fornication. I mean, how many people tell you that it just makes good sense, it's just wise, common sense, to move in with somebody for you know six months or so before you get married, just to make sure you can you know you're gonna get along okay and you're compatible and things like that. That's the that's the wisdom of this world. It's not right. It contradicts the word of God. So knowing the Bible will enable us to identify things which are not right and avoid them. And if we give ear to or hear, like wisdom says, if we hear God's commandments and keep all His statutes. We will do that which is right in his sight. And I'll just give you two verses and we'll be done for tonight. Exodus 15 and verse 26. Exodus 15, 26. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Notice what he says there. You hearken to the voice of the Lord, do which is right, give ear to his commandments. His commandments are right. And if we hear what God says and we learn what is right and we do what is right, there's a blessing in that. You know, it says in Proverbs 3, we looked at where it says that... Uh, Long life and peace shall they add to thee by keeping God's commandments. But you know, it will also keep you healthy. Because God says there in that verse that if you do which is right in my sight, you hearken to my commandments, I will not bring the diseases upon you that are brought upon the, the Egyptians. So that's one of the best health care plans you can have is doing what is right in God's sight. And guess what? If you do what's right when it comes to sex... You're not going to get the diseases that other people get. And if you do what's right with concer concerning moderation in drink, you're not going to get all the problems that drunkards get. Or if you do what is right in the, in, when it comes to gluttony and you don't overeat, you're not going to get morbidly obese. You're not going to get uh, diabetes and um, heart disease and things like that. But not only that, the Lord just we might protect you from diseases that, other people get that you could get if you do what is right. And I'll give you one more. Deuteronomy 13 and verse 18. And furthermore, think about this. One of the main reasons why a lot of these diseases, these awful diseases that people used to get that people don't get anymore, one of the main reasons for that is hygiene. Just within the last hundred years or so, 
Um, and But you know what? God taught Israel thousands of years ago to not live where you crap. You know, go dig a hole and crap in the hole and bury it and cover it up. Right? He taught them to do that oh, thousands of years ago. Their weapons were just supposed to have a paddle on the end of them, so you dig and poop, right? He taught them they were supposed to wash, right? They were supposed to bathe, and, and they, were, they were to wash their hands um, and, their and their pots and things like that. And the Pharisees made a lot of traditions about that, but still God taught cleanliness and washing things and things like that. Um, and if people would have just hearkened unto some of the basic principles that God taught, just, just keeping human waste away from the camp, that right there would spare people from a ton of diseases that people used to suffer and die from. That simple thing. All right, Deuteronomy 13 and verse 18. When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments which 